So this is going to be um, Hive Swap Volume 11. So let's jump right into it. I've heard some good things about this one. Like there's some really interesting characters in this one. So Another night, another long, long walk. Despite the blisters, you have started to feel truly optimistic. You've got a lot going on for you these days. True, you're still technically a castaway on a hostile planet with absolutely no help or rescue. But if you're completely honest, Earth was pretty shitty too. Sure, 98% of everyone here is a psychopath who would rip your face off as soon as look at you, but it's the other 2% that are really going to make it all worth it. So Malik Adelon, or Lanera Scalby, oh boy. She sounds, uh, vicious. Let's go with you, you sound fun. Even though you're Scorpio. Not to say that Scorpios aren't fun, they're, they're just usually very murdery. Maybe you're pushing your luck at this point. A reasonable person would just hit up one of their many, many new friends and find a place to crash. But the night is young, so to speak, and you have a good feeling about this particular desolate stretch of road. You're just wondering when you should hide out for the day, when a long car pulls up next, on, next to you on the street. You hunch your shoulders and keep walking, hoping they're just here for the scenery. But you are literally the scenery here, so when the back door opens and two trolls lumber toward you, you can't say you're surprised. You are a little surprised when they each grab hold of one of your arms and drag you into the car. Up until now, you have found trolls to be surprisingly chatty. You aren't expecting the assault and ask questions later approach. The car takes off before you have time to catch your breath. You will never catch that breath. It's blocked behind you now. It's loose. And here are you without, and here you are without your breath, face to face with the troll who's leaning back on his bench seat. Just straight chillin'. The dome light glints off his blue eyes and way too, and what someone less hip than you might describe as way too many piercings. He has them in his ears, nose, and eyebrow, he even has a couple in his horn. His hair is shaved in a daring undercut and his teeth are sharp. Hey. Hey yourself, asshole, or um, hey. Oh damn, some of your newfound self-confidence just bubbled out like you spit up from an infant. This is gonna go bad fast. But instead of immediately murdering you, I don't know if that's too loud, hold on. Just lower that down a bit. He looks you up and down, checking you out in all your ragged glory. He smiles slow and lazy. It does things to your guts, friendship things. His smile stretches wider, going slightly lopsided from his piercing. He looks like he likes what he sees, even if what he sees is you being a rude bitch. Fair. I just did get my boys to drag you off the street, and I get how that equals a, a little not chill. Sorry about all that. I'm Malik. Malik doesn't look too sorry, but you're distracted by one of his boys, who is looking at you through a familiar pair of eyes hidden beneath a fall of dark bangs. Hey, I was wondering if you remembered me. It's Demon! Hot dog boy! Oh, he is really short compared to other trolls, eh? He is a small one. Remember, you don't you'll forget, even with extensive therapy. Aw. Yeah, sorry about the cloak and laser bullshit. Just couldn't let anybody get their fronds on you first. You know. Well, he, he he was looking for you, like, specifically? For sure, dude. I've been following you. Really? You feel like you would have noticed someone like him. He doesn't exactly blend in. Malik holds up his palm husk with the chitter app open. He recognized your own profile. Your follower count has gone up significantly since the last time he checked. Right. So, everyone equals, uh, going on about this new chitter account. Alien Invasion of One. Figure it's, a uh, publicity stunt or imperial propaganda. Uninteresting. Not worth my time. But then I started thinking, what if it's not? If this is genuinely an invasion, how the hell have this survived this long? The drone should have obliterated a Colbate son of a bitch like you right away. That's literally what I said. They should have taken your hornless head off parodies ago. They haven't. Why? This is what I keep asking myself. Then I figured out how you must be doing it. Without meaning to, you lean toward him. Have you finally found someone who understands and appreciates just how terrific you are at friendship maneuvers? Who really gets your area steady? You're a robot. Oh, God damn it! not even close. But he's so obviously and avid avidly interested in you that, well, you tell a tiny little fib. Uh-oh, you're lying. I'm a robot. Hell yeah. Hey, this is kind of crazy. I didn't know you were a robot. <laughs> Wild. I guess that makes sense, though. You did have a sixth sense for meat and where to find it. Malik looks intrigued. A meat tracker. That is interesting. Uh, sure, you hope he doesn't try to test that functionally. You don't- you have another meat miracle in you. But all he does is keep giving you piercing looks in between texting furiously. Then he snaps a photo of you. Oh, oh no, he's not going to post that on the chitter. Hashtag robot? You can't be a hashtag. Everyone will know that you're lying and blow up your cover, not to mention your mentions. Don't worry about that. Chill some media gives me hives. I have a gorgle alert set for certain combinations of words. 
After Zebra's place, you're kind of expecting another lavish palace, but when you get out in the car, you see that Malik is an indigo, he's cerulean. Like Elward and Remley and that one girl who kept boys in cages. Also, you're starting to think people's hives have more to do with taste than caste. Amisa had a homely little art studio. Togora had all those vases and shit. Before he leads you inside the apartment building, Malik turns to Damon and the other lowblood and starts messing around on this palm husk again. Nice job, guys. I'm rerouting a Cynthian drone shipment as we speak. Treyoff, I'm sending you those DVDs you wanted. They'll be at your hive when you arrive. Treyoff. Names. I'm writing down names. Treyoff, who is a lowblood. That's all we know. The bronze blood. Ooh. He's bronze. Okay, cool. I just like writing things down when I hear mentions of, like, new names and stuff. Browns to Malik, he looks a little uncomfortable and pats him off with on the arm. And Damon, I'll send your shit to, uh, that shrub you live in. <laughs> Thanks, man. You know, my offer still stands. I got a couple extra coops if you get sick of living rough. Demon shrugs. Thanks, but I can't be tied down. Nice to see you again. You and Malik ride the elevator all the way up to the top of the hive stem, and he leads you into a surprisingly tasteful loft apartment. Come on, my shit is upstairs. Isn't the whole apartment his shit? Yeah, technically. Let's go upstairs, though. He's so dirty. Filthy boy. He brings you to a higher level that has a recuperator room shoved against one wall and a couch shoved against another, but they are both afterthoughts just to just an ungodly amount of computer shit. Right when you got here, you probably wouldn't have been able to tell what it was, but now that you're used to Alternia's weird bug tech, squishy and organic and almost certainly alive, at least in a, in a way that plants are alive, Though a couple of wires in there are almost definitely slithering. Malik sits down in front of one of the screens and wakes it with a single swipe of his claws. He gestures you lazily into one of the several office chairs. It squeaks as you sit down and sinks a little under your weight. He proceeds to ignore you and type a list of commands into a text box. Then he pushes himself across into one to another screen with an alert flashing in one corner. You know what this is all adding up to. He's an IT guy. No, I'd prefer to be called, uh, oh, shit. I have this joke I do where someone calls me a hacker and I say, I prefer the term information specialist. But now that is ruined. Oh shit, hacker was totally your next guess. You can do it again. Nah, moment's gone. No worries. So he's a hacker. That's pretty cool and subversive. He wonder if he's part of Tizia's secret anti-government movement. You almost asked and stop yourself at the last second. Whatever Tizius's anarchist leanings are, you aren't going to blab them to this rando cerulean. As much as you'd love to meet your friends, you aren't really about to throw one under the scuttle buggy for no reason. Yeah, not a lot of blues get down on this sort of thing. Gold bloods are better with tech. They get that living battery noise, you know how it goes. Hmm. All the gold bloods you met have been, well, as Daya did have that scouter thing and Cooperm hacked a phone or something? Whatever, it was a while ago. Zabid mostly just like fanfic. Interesting, you'd think they would have programmed you with cultural stereotypes. Huh? Oh, right, you are a robot. You wonder how a robot is supposed to act. You sit up straighter and think about circuit boards. Malik misses around some more and screen and frowns. Then he frowns some more. Then he reaches down and picks up one of the thick purple wires from the mess on the ground. He pauses. Apparently he isn't sure where to stick it. He glances down and you cross your legs before you can pull up your dress up and start searching for external ports because nope, not happening, dude. You don't have any network connections, so I've got to use an ethernet. Don't be lame. You aren't trying to be lame. You just don't want things in work. This is eventually you compromise and let him stick it under your armpit like you're a baby having your temperature taken. You watch him tap away at his screen, marveling at the ludic ludicrous choices you made in your life that have led you to a troll sticking a wire under your armpit because you can't find your Wi-Fi signal. You sit there as his brow flowers further, and his frown gets more pronounced. His annoyance bounces him, bounces him out of his laid-back cool guy attitude, a blinking purple light flashes on his piercings. Fuck, maybe my tech isn't compatible. One of the wires is coming towards you, and for a second you think you finally found a piece of technology that is actually alive. But then you see a little flicker of movement at the end of it and realize that it's a white snake with beady, intelligent eyes. Ah, a Lucis. Don't be scared. He won't hurt you. He's just checking everything out. Of course not. Why would you be afraid of a giant snake winding up your legs? Everyone is really about your legs. You need to get a pair of pants. Is the snake checking for you for artificial parts? Are snakes particularly sensitive to technology? Is it because they're long? Hmm. Weird. This is a radical situation. I have no idea what to make of you, dude. Ugh, you, so you feel like such a dickhead. Can you really continue to live this lie? I'm a special kind of robot his instruments can't detect. Not a robot. Um. I am a special kind of robot his instruments can't detect. You're in this to win this. You're riding it out to the end. You tell him that you are actually the latest model of spy bot from your alien government. You are so advanced that you are indistinguishable from the real thing. Seriously, you aren't supposed to tell him, but you're telling him since he's so bad. Oh, this is terrible. You just promised yourself the other day you'd stop lying to make yourself look good. Or in this case, make yourself look like a robot. Besides, it's never going to buy it. 
I knew it. There's no other explanation. Fascinating. He leans in close enough that you almost tip backward on your chair. He catches your arm. He's surprisingly strong for such a skinny nerd, though you shouldn't really be surprised anymore. Size doesn't correlate the strength of trolls, necessarily. His skin is chilly and his nails press dents into the skin of your arm. It hurts, but not enough to shake him off. He's looking at you so seriously. What, does he think your eyes are USB ports? You apologize that your robot specs are not to the right ones. Malik breaks out of his trance and lets go of your arm. Are you kidding? What am I, some sort of script regular? This rules. I'm going to be the first to crack you. Yikes. You have expected him to start take some sort of torture screwdriver to start prying you open. Instead, he gives you another one of those unreasonably flirty smiles. When I'm done with you, I'm going to own your entire system. Whoa. I'm hungry. Are you hungry? With that, he takes off down the steps, jumping to the last few and vanishing down into the kitchen. He left there blinking with his, after his af at his after image. It sounded like he was hitting on you back there, but then he just pranced down the stairs like a bejeweled antelope. I feel like I should check my sound. Yeah, no, I'm good. Okay. You creep down to the kitchen to find him pulling things out of cabinets, opening the fridge with his toes, and then slamming it shut with a hard kick so that all the stuff on top rattles. His palm husk rings, and he pulls it out of his pocket, answering it and spitting a bunch of jargon at the person on the other end. He does all this while rooting around in a drawer of cutlery, talking loud enough to be heard over the rattling. All you know is about hacking is that it's usually done by a bunch of greasy dudes with glasses and Dorito dust in their fingers. Usually there's a girl and she's hot. You aren't sure what trip Malik is yet, possibly a combination of all of them. While he yells at somebody over the phone about blockchain, you take the time to wonder, rather sheepishly, how many other piercings he has and on what parts of his body. I haven't tried fucking with robots yet, really. So far, I've only reprogrammed Jones remotely. You realize belatedly that he's no longer on the phone and is instead talking to you. Oh, right, he mentioned something about that earlier with Demon. Hacking into drones to reroute their delivery routes. Yeah, re rerouting is easy. I almost got all my gear that way. All, all the good stuff is reserved for blues. Wait, isn't Malika blue? He laughs and put a pan on the stove. As if. Sure, Cerulean is blue, but barely. Every indigo you meet is going to make sure you know it. You want to ask him if you can help him with anything, but you barely know how to cook when you're on your own planet. He pauses with two eggs above a mixing bowl. Hey, you like cluck beast embryos? What now? He cracks the eggs. The yolks are purple and runny. Your stomach squirms uncomfortably. Oh, my bad. Can you even eat? What? Oh, yeah. Robot. Of course you can eat. It wouldn't be a very clever disguise if you couldn't eat, right? Although now that he mentions that you really haven't been eating as much as you did on Earth, the meals you've had have been few and far between, but you aren't even that hungry. Hmm. Weird. Oh, God. What if you are a robot? Plot twist. Malik is not privy to your ex existential crisis, and therefore keeps cracking eggs. Cluck beast embryos. God, troll roads are so ridiculous. Not really. No language is inherently more ridiculous than any other, subjectively. They really should have programmed that in when they taught you to read Alternian. What? Nobody taught you how to read. You're on chitter. All of your chirps are Alternian. Let me see your palm husk. He holds out a hand for your phone. His nails are painted a shimmery black, and he has one of those thick rings that could double as a brass knuckle. You tell him that you figured he had, you had the palm husk on the Earth setting, but of course that makes no sense. Nobody here knows about Earth, or about English, for that matter. You're pretty sure it's not even the most commonly spoken Earth language. Nope. No translation software running. And this is good old-fashioned Alternian. Well, it's not old-fashioned, it's contemporary. That's an idiom. See, if you weren't a robot, this would be really weird. Well, it is kind of already kind of weird that you're a robot, but your Alternian is perfect. You want to tell him that your Alternian is no way perfect. You have literally no idea what is going on. But before you can get the words out, a terrific crash comes from somewhere above you. Malik drops your palm husk into the bowl of cluck beast embryos. Dang. Fuck. Drones. Shit, you have, you don't need this right now. You a fake robot with no chance again a, a real robot with lasers even worse Malik rounds on your lips drawn back from his teeth. You, this is your fucking fault. They must have tracked you here. No other way could they find this place. I'm off the grid. You try to point out to Malik that maybe the drones aren't mad about all the hacking business, but he isn't listening to you. He's shoving his palm husk into his and pocket and making a leap for the kitchen window. Fuck, can he survive a ten-story drop? You aren't sure. One thing's for sure, though, you can't. Oh, I'm not a friend. The lad about being a robot. That's just how it be. Of course, there's construction. Ah. Alright, let's go that bad end at the beginning there, too. Um, hey. You remember a hello while trying not to meet those alarming blue eyes? Because although you've amassed quite a cache of high blood hose, you know what blue typically means for you. Yikes o'clock. You don't love the idea of throwing yourself out of a moving vehicle, but you also don't love being stuck in one, of the, in one with a high blood. And past evidence has shown that although wild acts of foolhardly daring ending in pain and embarrassment, you have not actually been killed yet. If you didn't die then, you probably won't die now. That is 100% how probability works. You open the door and before the trollers ruffians have a chance to protest you, all the out of there. You were right, you don't die, but it sucks. 
sweet plant. <laughs> okay, now to do the actual good root. Oh, I have such an actual terrible headache right now, and that like thing is not making it any better. Ugh. Another night, another, yeah, I've already read that. Okay. Boop -a -boo. <laughs> I'm not a robot, unfortunately. You brace yourself, and your experience dealing with the fallout of your deceptions is never pleasant. You expect him to throw you out, or at least get a snake to the face. Instead, Mel just sags back into his desk chair, which settles with a depressed little squeal. He takes his glasses off and drops them into his desk, palming out his eyes. It strikes you how exhausted he looks. You thought the dark smudges were eyeliner, but they might be eyeliner and despair. You wonder if now is the time to start apologizing. You're getting really good at apologies. That's chill. I was the one who grabbed you off the street. You were probably scared of what I'd do to you if you weren't what I hoped you were. Well, more like you worried about the friend opportunity that would swirl down the drain, but yeah, okay, you were also a little scared. You still are. It's a total body-encompassing ambient fear that's always buzzing in the background of everything you do on Alternia. So subliminal that sometimes you wonder if it's the total opposite. The complete absence of fear. That is deep, man. In retrospect, it's pretty much fucking stupid to assume a robot is going to solve my problems. Very true. In your limited experience, more robots, more problems. Yeah, it was just something you knew, you know? Something I hadn't tried yet. What is it exactly that he's trying so hard to do? He seems to be pretty well off with the hacking drones and shit like that. <laughs> Malik laughs. Yeah, hacking drones. That is all just bullshit. He loose his curls around his ankle affectionately. He gives him a little nudge. His palm husk rings and pulls it out for his pocket and just looks at it for a couple seconds. I can't deal with this right now. Come on. He heads down to the lower floor, waiting at the bottom of the steps to see if you're falling. You are, albeit nervously. You are having a hard time reading, Malik. Maybe it's all the piercings. It gets worse when he calls the elevator and then stands back. After you. You expect swinging blades to come at you, but they don't. You expect Malik to attack, but he doesn't. He just slumps moodily against the elevator wall and closes his eyes. His palm husk rings again, and his jaw tenses. So far? I don't know why, but I'm getting rogue feelings from him. Just because I know his aspect in time, and now I know what time means for Hive Flop specifically, and what they're focusing on. The elevator goes past the lobby, then it goes past the basement, and the sub-basement- Fuck, what's the sub of a sub-basement? Dude, what? The sub-sub-basement is just a square dungeon-like space jam trickling down the walls. Your stomach crumples and your heart bounces up into your throat. Oh no, is this Malik's Cerulean murder dungeon? A phantom pain presses against your ribs and arm. But Malik just leads you through a gap in the wall that you initially look took for a shadow. It opens to a tunnel with rough stone walls and dirt covered floor. It's clearly man-made, or troll-made. The air grows damper and the sound of rushing water gets closer and closer. You emerge from the tunnel and find yourself in the bank of a wide underground river. Malik sits down on the edge of the overlook. Sit down. Sorry, this is not as comfortable as the loft. As the loft. Oh man, Malik brought you to a special place. I don't know if I'd call it special, but it is a place I come a lot. You sit down next to him. You know, you get how this could be pretty zen, just watching the dark water flow by. The walls glow with an eerie vile luminescence, digging craters underneath Malik's tired, tired eyes. Also, he pulls his phone out and shows you the screen. No husk signal. This is the only place I can really unplug. Kind of relaxing, you know? Oh yeah, you imagine the demands of being an information specialist could really put a dent in your chill. Heh, <laughs> yeah. You sit there with a rock digging into your ass and allow yourself to appreciate just how deep this gesture of trust really is. Even after you lied to him, he still wants to tell you his life story. Fuck, you love life stories. You ask him exactly what he wants with your non-existent robot lores. He said something about reprogramming drones, didn't he? Could he be part of the resistance? What? Oh, you mean all that low blood spread stuff? Nah. What is even the point? That's a great way to get cold. But he helped Demon and the other little guy. Yeah, but they're cool, and I was paying them for services rendered. Roughen you up. He nudges you with his elbow. So far, all I've been able to do is reroute delivery drones, just some weak sauce shit like that. That is a pretty pathetic way to fuck up the si system. You aren't sure you get what he's about. Why care about fucking up the system if you don't want revolution? I guess I wouldn't mind revolution. Well, Turney is alright. Well, for me it is alright, not for everybody. I'm not so fucking myopic to think I don't have it better than a lot of trolls, and... I'm not one of those bulge biters who wank off about the sanctity of the blood and how low, blo low bloods deserve what they get. <laughs> they don't. It blows. I don't blame them for feeling bad or whatever. I just gotta worry about myself. That is all the energy I got for. Well, he does seem to be doing pretty okay. Like, he has a sweet pad. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, for half a sweet, maybe. 
Then it's all gone. Everything I've worked for and I'm up in motherfucking space. Right, the space war. Sounds like a huge drag. Yeah, dude. He tosses a rock into the dark water below. But that is the plan, alright. If I own the drones, I own the whole system. I own the heiress. Then I'll be playing my game, my rules. His eyes glint in the semi-darkness, and so does the little hint of fang when he smiles. His piercings light up like tiny points of fire. You tell him that sure sounds like revolution talk to you. Also possibly villain talk. He grins like you're flattering him. Alright, but him sweeps away from that, and other hackers won't. I mean, I work alone. I'm not a fucking psionic. I can't use mind, honey. It won't kill me the way it would a rusty, but it definitely get the runs. And I don't have sweeps. I have months. Maybe paragies. You ask me if he thinks things are going to be really bad for him up there in space. Like I said, not a psychic, so no one's going to turn me into a battery. They'll make me a fucking soldier. Or a spy. What about his hacker skills? Oh yeah, check out all my illegal activities. Please give me a good assignment. Hell no. Yeah, he couldn't really put that on his resume. If I was a high blood, I could get away with it, probably. Or they might think it was cute if I was a low blood. But midcast is like, no way. Fuck, there's gotta be something. He pulls out his palm husk and starts frantically tapping away. Wait, you thought he didn't have a signal down here? Yeah, but I got a Wi-Fi hotspot. What am I, some kind of fucking ludite? He gestures to one of his earrings. You aren't sure if he means his jewelry is the Wi-Fi hotspot, or if that's a troll gesture for you are an idiot. Hey buddy, you said you were gonna unplug. That's important to your mental health, right? Getting off the internet once in a while? You can't really speak for yourself since you've only very recently become an internet celeb. Malik waves you away. You make a grab for his palm husk. You are honestly aren't sure why. Maybe you're trying to be flirty or playful or some shit because everyone knows there's nothing more flirty and playful than stealing people's stuff. Bitches love that. You manage to snatch it away, but your floppy fingers fumble and you lose your grip. Malik's phone sails over the edge of the bank and into the dark waters below. That splash is the sound of your doom. Malik stares at the water, then he stares at you. His mouth moves soundlessly. You threw my tech in the water. Um. Malik puts his hands on your shoulder. Somehow, against all impossible odds, he's still gonna be chill. Wow, what a guy. You hit the water before you know what's happening. It isn't freezing, but it sure as hell isn't balmy either. The current grabs you and tugs you under. Your knees and elbows scrape rocks, and your dress tangles around your legs and makes it hard to kick back toward the surface. The water is so dark you don't even know where the surface is. Just when you're making peace with the fact that your grave is going to be a watery one, something grabs you from behind and hauls you upward. You gasp out in air, choking in more water than anything else. Two strong hands push you back into the bank, then begin smacking you on the back. You don't think it'll help you cough up any water, but you do think it's going to bruise. My bad, dude, that was reflex. You threw my shit in the water, so I threw yours. Are you okay? You hack up one more gasp of water and you give Malik a thumbs up. He says, what is you are? Hair slicked off the back of his forehead. It makes his eyes look huge and impossibly blue. He'd jump in to save your clumsy ass. His shirt is gone, and hey, now you know the location of two more of his piercings. You apologize for grabbing his phone, and in retrospect, you should not have tried to be cute at the edge of the river. Yeah, you don't have to try. I mean, fuck. Malik flushes. R right now, you just look like a drowned squeak beast. Sorry, I fucked up your rumpus robe. I'll lend you something. Cool, you're kind of over this dress anyway. Hey. Malik twists his claws together. You aren't gonna tell people what I said earlier. I'm, I'm not... I'm not afraid to go off-planet. I just... you know... This time you do know. You tell him his secret is safe with him, and if you find any actual robots in your travel, you'll send him his way. Yeah, thanks. Here. He helps you to your feet. Damn, it's cold down here. I'll get you something back when we get back upstairs, as long as you don't mind wearing my sign. You, know, you can't think of anything you'd like more, honestly. Friendship! Aw, it's adorable. <laughs> okay, so for Malik, um... There's really not tons there. I had uh, vibes from Rogue because um, parts of his route, like he really wants to do this whole hacker thing and like control the system and whatnot. But when it comes down to it, like when, when he has like little things of failure, it really gets him down, like really brings him down. Um, and when it comes to like someone being like, go, 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 got to do the thing, like that little square of like night thief rogue page, uh, Rogue is the one who like, really shows when they get down when they lose because they have that whole like oh man maybe i'm not actually good enough for all this shit knight feels that would but would hide it uh page doesn't really feel that they would just like false confidence their way back up uh, immediately and thief is like fuck yeah i'm the best so that's where i'm getting like slight rogue vibes from him um the other end of that is he does seem a little bit of like a control freak like just ref reflexively instinctively a control freak has to have control over environment, wants to control over the rogues, um, doesn't really care for others so much, but just wants to have, like, control of his own life and his own environment and that kind of thing. So that, that idea of, like, wanting to be in control, like, 
it does sound kind of like either Witch or Air. Um, I'm going to probably go for Air, though, because he seems more of a passive person overall. Uh, which fitting with the either the rogue air. So he's definitely a passive class. Um, and him being a go-getter is like obviously due to him being the time player as well. Um, but yeah, I'm, there's not really much to go on other than he seems really chill. And I know that chillness seems to be kind of like a character trait that all airs share. Uh, rogues tend to be a bit more up on the up and up, not quite so chill. Um, but yeah, I'm not really getting a lot of vibes from him other than like either possibly rogue or air. I know that's a weird uh, couple of classes to be stuck on, but that's just kind of the things I get from him. Maybe if I think about him some more, I'll get a better idea. Okay. Now to the, the fun one. The fun F-U-N one. Lanera Scalby. You've had such good luck making friends lately that you feel almost popular. But at the same time, you feel a strange sense of loneliness that new friendship doesn't seem to penetrate. Maybe being the only one of your species light years away from home is starting to catch up with you. Or maybe you're starting to understand why popular kids in movies sometimes seem so sad. A number of trolls now like you, but a number of trolls now like you, but do any of them truly know you? Well, you wouldn't give to hang out with someone who you have a real history with. Someone with whom you don't have to do the introductory dance of, yes, I'm clearly an alien, no, I don't know what's going on. Someone with whom you could reminisce about old times. Someone you've hung out with once, more than once. Right now you're in the outskirts of town, and the rocky outcrops surrounding you are familiar, and you're pretty sure that the entrance to the brooding caverns is around here somewhere. Oh, we're going back down there. Your heart beats a little faster. Branya lives close to here and talk about history. You two know each other deeply from hanging out once and then seeing her again in her ex-mates for its hive. Plus, you have a phone now. You have the power to text first. You go to the f get the phone Conal gave you, looking at the uh, looking at look at you go reading an alien language and operating alien technology just fine. Does it make sense that you've learned how to read a new alphabet in weeks without anyone teaching you? Not really, but maybe your struggles with Spanish that class in high school were just a fluke, and you've been a serial linguistic genius this whole time. Bronnie texts you back immediately, giving you directions for how to meet her in the caves. You head down, but before the Jade Blood Hive is in sight, a troll emerges from the shadows. At first you think it's Branya, but you freeze midway when this tro new troll steps into the light. Branya doesn't wear glasses, and she never has glared at you like that. It's you. I remember you. You were down here a few weeks ago. Bothering Branya and distracting her when we almost had a Lupus's stampede. Um. That, that's quite a, uh, meter there. Ouch. Is that really how Branya has described your adventures together? Maybe it's silly for something that small to hurt your feelings when another recent friend nearly got you killed in Clown Church, but you like to think you and Branya formed a real connection. She never made you feel like you were bothering her. A real connection? Is that why you think you can just come down here and text her? Holy shit, is Lenera reading Branya's messages? Does Branya know she's been doing that? That's none of your business. Branya and I are best friends. I'm just looking out for her. She has a lot of jade blood responsibilities. It doesn't need anyone shifty coming in to disrupt her. You have to wonder if Branya would agree with the statement made on her behalf, and you sure would like to see her in person and confirm for yourself. Oh, you'd like that, wouldn't you? Why don't you tell me? What is the nature of your relationship? Why should I allow you to hang out with her? Mm -mm. As your text message so boldly suggested. Bluffing has saved your ass in some bleak situations before, but you could also go on the offensive here. You're concerned about Branya's privacy now, and as her friend, maybe you shouldn't just look the other way. Make wild claims about your friendship with Branya to save yourself. What right does Lenara have to creep on Branya's phone? Wild claims of friendship. You and Branya go way back. If Lenara is unfamiliar with your history, it might be because your friendship with Branya predates hers. And actually, part of why you texted her today was because your close friendship has been recently beginning a little red, you could say. Branya needed someone to step in and fill the hole in her blood pusher left by Elward, after all. Concerning the changing nature of your relationship, Branya has been even more protective of you than usual lately. Lanera doesn't seem impressed by your astute cultural knowledge, nor does she look intimidated. Her glasses reflect opaque in the murky cavern light as she takes a step closer. Her claws, you've just noticed, are very sharp. Branya is very protective of those she pities. You've got that much right, if you're telling the truth. And I don't know that you are. Maybe she would want to protect you, if she knew that you were here. Oh, fuck, you fucked up. If Lanera intercepted Branya's phone, then Branya has no idea you reached out, and you can be disposed of with none the wiser. Oh, no. Look what you made me do. 
You had no idea what someone in the skirt could that long could move so fast. Oh, I did. I did. That didn't go so well. Oh, she sounds like she's going to be murdery, murdery fun. Also seems very controlling, but much more actively controlling. I'm already going to peg her as a witch. <laughs> Uh, what right does Lanera have to creep on Branya's phone? You puff up with all the self-righteousness you can muster. The nature of your relationship with Branya is between you and Branya, and you're not doing anything suspicious by wanting to see your friend. In fact, it seems a lot more suspicious that Lanera is trying to intercept anyone who messages Branya. What possible reason could she have to justify that? Well, I never. As I said before, I am Branya's best friend. I take a relationship, I mean my responsibilities as a friend, very seriously. You press the issue, narrowing your eyes and crossing your arms over your chest. Your responsibilities as a friend, huh? Sounds kind of fishy. Fishy. Are you serious right now? Serious. Serious. Are you really coming down here making fish puns like some kind of sea dweller? That is so suspicious. Who knows what Branya decided to show you when you tricked her into trusting you? Not that we have anything to hide, but who knows? If you're at all associated with sea dwellers, then we have a pretty big problem on our hands, don't we? You've heard of sea dwellers by now, but none of your friends have talked about them much. Mostly you've gathered that they dwell in the sea. You don't know why it would be extra bad for you to be one of them, but it's clear you need a backpedal. Before you can try to disown your choice of fish-related phrasing, Lanera advances on you. Obviously, I can't let you talk to Bronya now. You're way too suspicious. I think you and I should have a private conversation instead. At least your life is uneventful when you're unconscious. Oh. She's got a fun little, uh, little dungeon. Ooh! Look at those. Oh, that's so cool. In the brooding caverns, they would have books, like, specific, about each specific sign, about, like, oh, I want to know what's in every single one of those books. When you, oh, I just noticed all the blood. When you come to, you're sitting in a chair with your wrists tied. As your eyes adjust to the darkness, you realize that you're in a smaller cave than the big open caverns that led to the jade blood hive. A light switches on, and you can see that the cave walls are lined with bookshelves. And there's a desk in the corner. There are books and notebooks and bulletin boards with the, what looks like outlines and study guides pinned, up the, pinned to them. Yeah. And in front of you is Lanera, holding a knife. Oh good, you're awake. This is my study cave. In Jade Blood Hive, it's harder to concentrate because people break the rules and I get irritated. So I come here to do my homework. Yeah, definitely, definitely a control freak. Uh, makes sense. Witch of Rage. This is making a lot of sense for her. <laughs> That's all. Just homework. When you take a second look at the bulletin boards, you see that a lot of L what Lanera has pinned up are pictures of Branya. There are a few pictures of Lanera and Branya together, but it's mostly just Branya by herself, and even a couple blurry photos of Branya and Elward. What are you looking at? There's nothing to see here. She brandishes the knife in your face, and okay, yeah, nope, she sure and her gigantic knife have your full attention, and you are not looking at her creepy Branya shrine anymore. I brought you here because your messages to Branya were highly suspicious. I don't know you, and I don't trust you. You could be trying to see Branya for nefarious purposes. So I brought you here, to vet you. Now we can talk about your, what your real intentions are. So you're definitely going to die in this cave, held captive by an unhinged jade blood who was convinced of your guilt from the moment you dared to text your best friend. That kind of sucks. You tried so hard and you got so far, but in the end it didn't even matter. Oh come on, stop playing the victim. If anyone is victim here, it's me. I try so hard to be there for Branya as her best friend, but she... She doesn't even... And there stops abruptly. You see her lower lips start to tremble before she turns her face away from you. The sharp tip of her knife pointed at your throat droops a bit. Its dejected swing takes it dangerously close to your navel, and you try to subtly lean backwards in your chair. Lanera interprets the noise of distress that escapes your mouth as a noise of sympathy. It's fine, though. R really, it's fine. Our friendship is great. I, I wouldn't change anything about it. It's fine as long as she doesn't have any other friends. Because I'm her best friend. I should be the only one she needs. Lanera's life is now completely lowered, pointing at the floor. That gives you some hope. She seems to have forgotten about her sea-dweller sea sea suspicions. Maybe if you keep her talking about Branya, the whole stabbing notion can be taken off the table, and she might even let you go. You rack your brain for all the knowledgeable attorney and relationship dynamics that you've managed to compile during your time on this planet. Best friends, they have a special word for that, right? You tell Lanera that you're sure Branya doesn't need anyone else. If she and Branya are more else, then Lanera must be very special to her. What? I never said we were more else. That's not even the quadrant I want her in. I mean, uh, never mind, how dare you make assumptions? Hello, knife point again. Oh shit, all you meant was to say was that her relationship with Bronnie was probably fine. 
You figured they must be in a quadrant together because you're a clueless alien. You're bad. I get why you would think that. Ugh, it's probably so obvious that my, my feelings for her are very red. Lenora hangs her head and her shoulders shake. Tears roll down her cheeks, dripping onto her crisp shirt collar and the knot of her jade green tie. I know I don't have a chance. She doesn't think of me that way. I'm her loyal friend and second in command. That's all I will ever, that's all I will ever be to her no matter what. And I tried to do a really good job at being her best friend. Because what else can I do? If I'm her best friend, then at least I'm still in her life. At least I mean something to her. Maybe it's the fact that Lenera's knife hasn't come close to any of your major arteries for a hot minute, or maybe it's the tears. Either way, you feel sympathy encroaching on the monopoly that abject terror has previously maintained in your brain's economy. You've acted as a verbal sounding board or a sympathetic ear for some of your other troll friends while they dealt with crises of various kinds. Subbing into the role of therapist. Hmm, they use the word crisis. I was going to totally, totally say witch there, but if she's a bard of rage, that'd be hilarious. Just a ding that might be a possibility. It's probably not, though. Slipping into the role of therapist for someone who's holding you hostage at knife point is a new one for you, but unfortunately it's not that much of a stretch. It seems like young trolls in Alternia have to deal with these very heavy life issues by themselves, feeling so alone that they're willing to turn to an alien stranger to help them work things out. Then again, maybe life is that grim and isolating for human te teenagers too, and you just never noticed before. Maybe everyone's, everyone's too mired in their own shit to look up and realize that the moon-based moon fecal matter is waist high for everyone around them too. You clear your throat and, you, and speak with as much consoling gentleness as you can muster while your head still throbs from where Lanera knocked you out. It seems like trying to be Bron Bronya's best friend isn't making Lanera very happy. Of course it isn't making me happy. I can't keep her from having other friends no matter how hard I try. And she's amazing, so of course everyone wants to be her friend. Including you, apparently. You barely even had a chance to miss that knife before it's waving around again. Yikes, your, your friendship with Vranya is nothing like her relationship with Lanera. You don't count as any kind of competition. Vranya is one of many friends to you, and while you cherish her and support her endeavors, you appreciate the joy and fulfillment that can come from having many different friends, instead of depending on a single person to meet all of your emotional needs. Sounds fake. Why would I ever want any friends besides Vranya? She's my whole world. Okay, but it seems like it's painful for Lanera to be relying on Branya to be her whole world when Branya isn't doing the same in return. Has Lanera ever talked to Branya about any of this? No. Never. I'm terrified to tell her how I feel. Being her best friend feels awful. But losing her would be so much worse. I can't take that risk. But if Lanera never talks to Branya about her feelings, she'll always be unhappy because she wants more. Even if she thinks that it's unlikely that Branya feels the same way, maybe open communication with her friend could help Lanera process her feelings and move on. You know that Lanera has a big heart, or blood pusher, and many fine qualities, and she doesn't deserve to be stuck in this unhappy, unrequited relationship purgatory forever. Wow, you really think I have fine qualities? You try very hard not to think about the glint of that knife. Sure, Lanera has positive qualities. She seems loyal, and well-organized, and murderous, and studious, and caring. Some troll out there is going to want the same kind of closeness for her that Lanera is looking for, and she owes it to herself to take actions that could lead to happiness, instead of being stuck in a sad situation forever. I don't know. Maybe you're right, or maybe you're wrong. But I don't want to move on, even if I know I should. I just... I just want to be with Branya forever. Lanera crumples to the ground, dropping the knife and sobbing into her hands. It's not hard to watch someone in this much distress and not want to help them, but on the other hand, her misery has distracted her, and this might be your only chance to try and escape. Attempt comfort. Attempt escape. I feel like escape is going to go badly. Let's go where? You look around to see if there's anything within reach that you could use to free your round hands. On the desk a few feet away, you spot a spiral-bound notebook with a nasty-looking edge on its binding. You scoot your chair over, doing your best not to make any noise, but Lanera is too busy wailing to notice regardless. You get a hold of the notebook and saw through the rope on your wrists. It was so hard to watch her and Elward together. Elward doesn't deserve her. She was so mean. I know she's a spoolian, but I swear if she sews her face in the caverns again, I will go straight for her primary spurt artery. It's a good reminder that Lanera is dangerous. You saw faster in success. Your hands are now untied. Lanera's back is turned to you while she gets up from the floor, and you take a quick look at the notebook in your hands. It seems to be a carefully annotated and organized scrapbook diary, chronicling Lanera's friendship with Branya. On the one hand, it's a bit creepy in the context of how you're still held hostage by the person who made this, but on the other hand, it does pull at your heartstrings. But you keep a firm grip on these heartstrings because you've still got to get out of here. When Lanera turns back to face you, you leap from your chair, brandishing the note scrapbook in front of you like a shield. If she comes any closer with that knife, you can destroy the scrapbook in an instant with your... Acidic spit, that's right, your alien anatomy has destructive powers that can vaporize Lanera's precious Branya memories in seconds. No, you can't. What are you doing? How dare you touch that book? For a terrifying second, you think she might lunge at you, but then Lanera steps to the side, giving you a straight shot to the cave exit. As you scuttle your way towards freedom, you remember your phone. Lanera took it from you when she knocked you out, and you don't know how you could possibly get another one. No way. I'm not giving you anything you might use to contact Branya. 
I won't have you messaging her behind my back and trying to replace me as your best friend. It seems like nothing you said when you were tied up had any impact on her at all. Maybe forcing people at knife point to be your therapist doesn't result in quality therapy. You still feel bad for her, but it's time to break out the big guns. If Lanera doesn't return your phone, you will find another way to reach Bronnie and you'll tell her everything. Not only the lowdown on Lanera's stalking and kidnapping tendencies, but also the truth about how Lanera feels about her. Lanera gapes at you. Her eyes fill with tears again, but she hands over your phone. I can't believe how cold you are. I thought that maybe we were bonding. That maybe I could start to trust someone other than Bronya. But you didn't mean a single word of all those things you said. Lanera's face twists and contorts between rage and grief. When you make the phone scrap of trade, she drops the knife in her other hand and clutches the scrapbook to her chest like it's one of those wrigglers in the Jade Blood Nursery. You don't feel guilty for doing what you had to do to escape unharmed, but you can't help but wish that you'd actually been able to help her. It's clear to me now. Bronya is the only friend I will ever have. That's a terrible end. Oh, she's so dangerously sad, I would call that picture. Okay. Now, now let's try the good end. And I thought the Cerulean Blood was going to be terrifying. I love fast forwarding and the knife, the knife meter just goes up and down. Attempt comfort. You remember what you did for Polypo when she was upset. Sitting in a chair with both hands tied behind you doesn't make for ideal shoe strapping conditions, but maybe you can approximate the gesture? Lenera is huddled crying on the floor, and you think you should get close enough to lean your knee against her back or something. Hopefully that would be interpreted in the same way as the classic palm-to-cheek move. You inch your chair closer to her, but you lose your bearings and wobble and then topple forward. Lanera's discarded knife is right there, sharp edge ready to plunge into your incoming soft body, but then Lanera moves quickly and grabs your chair and saves your life. Oh shit, that was a close one! You really could have died! She stares at the knife with huge round eyes, clearly shaken up by your near-death experience just now. Considering how often you nearly die with these days, you feel more blasé about it, but you're glad it's having an impact on her if it makes her rethink the whole kidnap and stab thing. I'm so sorry. I don't want you to actually die. I saw what you were doing with that chair when you fell. You were trying for the traditional seated frond hinge shoosh pad because I was upset. It was very kind of you to try and console me. I never really thought you were a sweet dweller, you know. Maybe what I'm doing is wrong. Lanera sits her jaw with conviction and with one slash cuts you free of your bonds. You get to your feet, stumbling a bit because your leg fell asleep. You can't believe you're getting out of the situation without any blood loss. You feel positively elated about this turn of events, but Lanera still looks sad. You're free to go. You must think the worst of me after all this. Well, you're not going to lie, this wasn't the best start to a friendship you've ever had, but horrifyingly enough, it also wasn't the worst. You feel for Lanera, and you want to show her how a real friend making a aficionado gets out there and meets people. You think making new friends could help her feel less clingy about Branya. Oh, you would really do that for me. I'm not so sure about new friends, but you do seem to know what you're talking about. You don't know where to go with Lanera to teach her how to make new friends. She's probably a bit too uptight to enjoy the music clubs you've been to, and you don't think that troll studying in the book hive would take kindly to a lot of loud, friendly conversation. You decide to go to that cafe that Elward introduced you to. Thankfully, they're not having an excessive bodily force poetry night, since you're not sure that would be Lanera's scene. There are a few number of ceruleans here, but you also spot a few indigos and teals and a cluster of defiant-looking olive bloods with those yellows, all sitting together. The crowd is overall less pierced and undercutted than it was when you were here with Elward, and the vibe is laid back, with all the trolls just sitting around, quietly chatting. You order the drinks, we're already taking for granted your newly acquired, acquired skill in reading troll language. Lanera is fidgeting when you sit down with her. This may come as a shock to you, but I don't get out of the caverns very much. I don't have time. There's so much to learn about jade blood life and troll reproduction, and Bronnie needs my help to maintain order. It's not very often that I have to uh, interact with trolls of other blood clothes. You're not sure what's making her uncomfortable, but trolls around here that are lower on, than her on the spe human spectrum are those that are higher. You've worked out by now that jades are right in the middle, so maybe Lenora identifies with neither the haves nor the have-nots. From what you remember, neutrality is a big concept with jades. You assure Lenora that it's natural to be a little nervous. Most people feel like they're stepping out of their comfort zone when they make a new friend. If there's one thing you've learned as Alternia's resident friend-making expert, it's that terror and embarrassment are par for the course, but it's worth it in the end. I'm not nervous. We're embarrassed. I just, just... I don't know. Everyone seems disorganized and suspicious and untrustworthy and unknown. You have to bite your lip to keep from laughing. It's not even funny, it's just that Lanera is hissing all her words and leaning in towards you and glaring at you with the rest of the room, and your overall effect is uh, weirdly endearing. Like someone from a 1950s school uniform on a feral cat. Before you try to reassure her, a neutral ambles up to your table. She looks friendly. That's a friendly amble. She's wearing glasses and carrying a book bag and has a teal symbol on her chest, so she might be a nerd like a Lanera. This could be a good new friend match. Hi guys. New friend. New friend.
Obviously, a uh, throwaway character kill. <laughs> I think I've seen you before, around here before. Do you also study at the book hive? You open your mouth to invite this new friend to sit down, but before you can respond, Linera interjects. That's not any of your business, is it? Why do you even want to know? Obviously, anyone who goes to the book hive to study goes there for peace and quiet. So why would you think you can bother us just because you recognized us from here? Okay, okay, jeez. My bad, never mind. See you around never. And just like that, a golden opportunity for friendship was gone up in a puff of smoke. What was Linera thinking, being so rude? Doesn't she want to learn how to make friends? I've changed my mind, okay? There's no way I can be friends with any of the people here. I don't know them. Not like I know you. You're surprised to hear that Linera feels so positive about you when she was so ready to stab you an hour ago. She takes your hand in both her hands, squeezing your fingers tight. I know we didn't get off to a great start. And that's my fault, but I can make it up to you. We're friends now, and we'll be friends forever. And I will call anyone who even thinks about trying to fuck with you. This is not quite the lesson you had hoped to teach her about making friends. But maybe with fierce loyalty and possessive streak spread out between you and Bronya, Linera can be a little more low-key about being a friend to you both. The determined look in her eyes and the ominous glint of her glasses doesn't scream low key, but doesn't cha but changes don't doesn't always happen overnight. And you believe in second chances. You believe that Lanero will be capable of healthy friendship someday. Friendship, yeah. Complete obsessive control freak. That's what that is. So definitely a witch, <laughs> especially because she's a witch of rage. Yeah, definitely a witch of rage. Alright, that's about it. I've finished everything, so... Cheerily do.